All right, let me share my screen real quick. There we go. Um, my, my cool laser pointer. If you guys all, all see this, I think this is working. I'm getting a nod from Josh. All right, welcome everyone to our uh, advanced reverse engineering workshop. Um, I'm joined by Jeff and Matt, who are going to go after me, but I'm going to start us off. Here is the link to the slides. If you're interested, I'm just going to stall and spitball right here for a second as you feverishly type in this link. Use one at the end right. of reverse and one at the end of engineering. Very difficult. All right. So first thing we're gonna we're gonna wonder is we're gonna we're gonna I know we're doing advanced reverse engineering, but we're gonna cover the basics first. What is reverse engineering? So here we're gonna be covering software reverse engineering, which is the process of analyzing a piece of software to extract information about its design and implementation when its source code isn't available either fully or you have bits and pieces of it. Um, and this is typically done on a compi on compiled binary code. So the actual executable that you'll be given to run a program. Um, and yeah, here we have a nice thing about GDB. So one thing that, that often comes to mind, at least when I think of reverse engineering is, is it legal? You know, am I allowed to take someone else's work, someone else's program and kind of decompile it, mess with it and, and, and do different things to it. So it's kind of yes and no. Um, so it's perfectly legal to reverse engineer something to achieve interoperability between programs. So if something is outdated or broken or you need it to talk to some more modern um, operating system, that's totally OK. But it's not legal to do this for commercial purposes or if the software wasn't legally obtained. So you can't pirate something and then reverse engineer it. That's not cool. And this is generally regulated by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. If you're interested, I have some more links here um, on the slides. So the first thing I'm going to talk about when we're doing reverse engineering is the compilation pipeline, because this gets really important when we're doing reverse engineering is knowing what state our program is in um, and how it got there from the source code. Um, so as most of you already know, binary executables are created from source code through the process of compilation, hence compila compilation pipeline. Uh, and there are pretty much four steps between source code and executable, um, as you can see right here. So this is how we take this simple little hello world program here into these frightening zeros and ones that you see down there. So the very first step in compilation is the pre-processing stage done by uh, shocking the pre-processor, which deals with directives. So lines that begin with the pound symbol, I'm sure you've all done some of these. So you're including uh, a library or you're defining a macro, all that kind of things. Um, so in the sense it copies header files, it generates macro code to replace symbolic constants uh, and removes comments because the compiler could not care less about your comments. Um, and in order to stop GCC right after pre-processing, we use the dash E flag. I'm going to demo all of these later, so I uh, don't really pay attention to that. And it also produces what's called the .i file. Step two to compilation is, funnily enough, the compiler itself, which takes this pre-processed code and turns it into assembly code, uh, produces .s files. And so this produces the actual machine instructions uh, in a kind of human readable plain text called the IR code for intermediate representation. Uh, so we can read it, um, and it's the actual machine instructions, but the machine can't actually understand it just yet. And we use the dash, dash x flag in uh, GCC. Then we have the assembler, which takes the IR code and turns it into an object code, or into object code, rather, in binary. So this is when we can no longer really directly read it. Uh, produces .o file, um, and it pretty much makes the machine readable, like I said before. We can read this, we can't read this, but the machine is kind of the opposite. Um, I'm sure most of you have already seen this before. This is this is what you'll do if you have like many different source files like .c or .cpp files that you'll compile them individually into .o and then you can link them all at runtime or not at runtime before you actually create the executable with Shocker, the linker, which creates the final binary executable by doing two things. Um, linking files together, like I just said, the object codes they produce and linking different function calls with library definitions. So we can either do static or dynamic linking. I'm not really going to get into this. Static linking is where the entire library is copied over into the binary executable. And dynamic linking is when they're kind of brought in at runtime. It's a lot more complicated, uh, but we don't really have to worry about it here. Um, and after this final step, we have an executable. Um, here I see you, I've shown you, you can do it either on the source code itself or on the object file. Um, and if you don't give it an output or an, an, you know, a, a output file name, you'll just get a.f from GCC. And then bonus step, I kind of lied about there being four, uh, four steps. We got our fifth step, which is the loader, which is actually when you move the program into memory. Um, so it's part of the operating system that 
puts it into memory, sets up all the registers and sends it on its merry way. So it does all the preparatory tasks, like seeing that it's um, you know, validating permissions and seeing all the memory requirements, all that's fun stuff. Um, like I said, initializing registers, dumping the entry point, all that good stuff. So really quick, um, I know lots of you have done this before, but I'm just gonna demo compilation really quick. Um, here you can see a similar .c file to the ones I had in the slides. I've got some headers. I've got the hello macro here for my little hello world string, all that fun stuff. And I also have this. This is all on the slides if you want to reference it later. Um, so here's to run the preprocessor. Use that dash e flag, like I said, to get that hello.i file. So if I run this here, uh, I will get this .i file where you can see if we, so here's all the library stuff that's very complicated and very frightening. Um, and if you go way down to the bottom, you can see our code still very readable and very recognizable as ours, but you can see it took this hello uh, directive and put the string in here. It removed all my, all my glorious comments, all that fun stuff. Next step we can see here is the compiler. So I can actually run this on the .c, uh, the original source code, or I can run it on this .i file. I'll just do it on the .i because we're doing this kind of step-by-step -step here. Paste that in and open that up. And this is, like I said, this is kind of the, the machine or the, the human readable uh, machine instructions. Um, ignore that. Um, yeah, so, so this isn't really machine readable. We can kind of look at this right now. Then we'll assemble it, right? We'll take this .s file, turn it into that object file. This is the thing that we can link together. And now we can no longer really read this. So if I do a, a hex dump on it, uh, I'm sure as you already know, it's just going to be kind of a mess. We can, uh, you know, use a disassembler on this, use a decompiler. Um, don't worry about that. Matt and Jeff are going to talk about those. And then finally, we can do the linker. This is what you normally do when you're not worried about all, all the assembler, compiler, preprocessor. Pre we'll take this object file to produce this hello executable. And if we run that, we have our little hello world program, as you would expect. Um, I'm going to hand the reins off to Matt to talk about uh, disassembly. Stop sharing the screen. Uh, all right, thank you, Luke. Um, so, uh, like the name uh, implies, uh, and you can probably easily guess, uh, disassembling is basically the opposite of what an assembler does. Um, it takes that uh, binary encoded instruction, uh, machine code, um, and it turns it back into a more human readable uh, assembly language. Um, because information is lost at each step in the compilation pipeline, disassembling isn't an exact science. Um, let me explain that a little further. Um, the assembly code that you read is uh, precisely the interpretation of the machine bytes. Um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there. Uh, whatever the bytes are, um, there's an exact uh, operation that that specifies. So what you read in the assembly, um, in the disassembled output, is exactly what the uh, computer mm -hmm. is um, actually executing. Um, the part where it's not an exact science is, of course, the disassembled output um, doesn't give you a full picture of the original source code and the original program. Um, the easiest example would be uh, the comments, as you saw in Luke's demo. Um, the comments that he had in his source code were all, uh, you know, just disappeared uh, during um, one of those uh, steps. So you don't have everything that was in the original source file. Um, and in fact, you, you don't even have lines of source with a uh, disassembler. Um, so for best results, um, hopefully the uh, binary that you're debugging um, or that you're disassembling has debugging symbols. Um, uh, it's compiled with debugging symbols um, in GCC. Uh, that's the dash G. Um, so that gives uh, the disassembler a sense of um, sort of a correspondence between lines of machine code or uh, lines of assembly and uh, the original source file lines that they came from. Um, sometimes that will include snippets of source file. Um, and sometimes, you know, it'll often include uh, function names and variable names, uh, stuff like that. It gives you a better idea. Um, it's more, a much more difficult time if your original binary has been, uh, has been stripped, the symbol table has been removed. Uh, basically, the symbol table uh, lists um, a connection between uh, sort of addresses and function names. So if you've ever looked at some disassembled output, uh, you can usually find the main function by searching for the name main, um, which I'll, I'll show in a second. Um, so that is part of the symbol table. It, you know, it lists where functions are, among many other things. 
Um, so you can actually remove that from a binary using the strip command um, on Linux. Um, and uh, uh, that's very common in sort of like retail software or, or distributed software because uh, it reduces the size and of course it, it frustrates um, disassembly. Um, and also if the uh, executable has been optimized, um, that can also make disassembling more difficult to understand. Um, all right, so here I have an example of what some disassembled output looks like. Um, of course, to please Eggert, we're using Emacs to actually look at the output here, but um, the first command here you see is object dump with the dash D flag. Um, that's a pretty standard command. It's on most uh, Linux installs. Um, so we're disassembling a binary, and this is an actual binary that I uh, have come across in the wild uh, in a, um, uh, an actual CTF competition before. Um, and we can see on the screen here uh, that this is most of the main function. Um, and we can actually look through and, and see uh, sort of all the things that are in it. So let me actually uh, do this live. So um, object dump uh, with the dash D flag um, and binary is called rot13. Um, and we're going to redirect that output to rot13.hex. Um, and then we want to uh, run max on rot13.hex. Uh, so you can see here, we've got our Emacs. Uh, if we search for main, we can pretty quickly find our main function here. Um, go down as far as I wanted it. Um, so if we look through our main function, um, this gets into sort of the interpretation side of uh, disassembling. Um, you know, we can see sort of the normal function stuff at the top here, uh, you know, uh, managing the stack and, and allocating some space for local variables. Um, then we can see uh, we've got a couple calls to um, let's see, it looks like uh, puts here. Uh, that's what uh, that's what it's uh, labeled it as. So uh, it's printing some stuff onto the screen. Um, and then a printf, which is of course uh, uh, printing more. Um, so it prints out a bunch of different things. Um, and then there's an f get, so we know it's gonna ask for some user input. Um, looks like we have a call to uh, str len. Um, so, you know, getting the, how much user input was returned. Um, uh, actually another call to strlen. Um, and down here we have a pretty interesting section. So we see a lot of move ABS and then uh, large hexadecimal constants. Uh, this is one thing that um, binary uh, challenge authors will uh, often do, hint, hint, um, in many of their binary challenges uh, to actually obscure um, what the, the flag is. Um, of course, if you were looking at commercial software, this isn't quite as relevant, but since we're focused on the challenges that we're gonna give you guys, um, so move ABS is of course moving uh, that large hexadecimal constant as if it were uh, a number basically. Um, whereas uh, if it were a string um, that would show up using like the strings command on Linux. Um, instead it's treated as if it were a number uh, which hopefully makes it more difficult to uh, immediately see what the, what the string is. Um, so based on all of these characters, a lot of these look like uh, they are um, uh, ASCII uh, encoded um, text like 61 that's a, a valid printable ASCII character, 75, another 61. Um, so we have a pretty good idea that this is probably where the flag is printed. So when we actually go to uh, figure out how to uh, crack this challenge, we probably want to get to this point here. Um, and of course this goes on for a while. Um, and then move byte is basically the same thing, but with just a single byte. Um, all right, that's probably uh, enough of looking at that for now. Um, so you'll notice that uh, the first thing I did for this challenge was I actually uh, disassembled the, um, uh, I, I disassembled the um, code and I looked at it first. I didn't just go run the binary. Um, and the reason for that is oftentimes you're debugging things because you don't know what they do. So it can be uh, sort of not exactly dangerous. Uh, well, actually it can be dangerous if you're dealing with malware. Um, so when you get a binary, you usually don't want to just run it uh, first thing. Um, of course, nothing we're providing you is going to be malicious. Um, so you can be safe doing that. Uh, but if you were doing this in a commercial environment, um, you know, it, it could actually be dangerous to just run the, the binary straight off. However, uh, I know that this is safe, so I'm gonna run it. Um, and let's actually look and see if we can see uh, any of the stuff that we saw in the disassembled output. Um, well, so the first thing is we see uh, a bunch of lines that have been printed, which is what we expected. Um, and we can see it's waiting for some user input. Uh, it's telling us it's gonna uh, rot 13 the input. So let's just give it some input, A, B, C, D. And of course that produces NOPQ, which is the correct rot 13 output. Um, so that sounds about correct. Uh, that's what we expected. Of course, we don't have some sort of secret password or something. Uh, so we don't know what the actual answer is yet. Um, however, 
let me go back to my slides. Um, <clears throat> so the next uh, part of this demonstration, uh, we're going to be use what <clears throat> we're going to be um, uh, using uh, a couple, one of the programs on this list. Um, this is a list of disassemblers. You already saw uh, object dump, uh, but uh, the next one you're going to be using is GDB. Um, so GDB is actually a disassembler, um, or sorry, is actually a debugger, not a disassembler. Um, but I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, other, uh, I guess, uh, well-known or, or widely supported disassemblers um, include uh, IDA. That's very big in uh, commercial usage. It has a free and a pro version. Uh, Binary Ninja, Ghidra, developed by the NSA. Um, Jeff will talk more about that later. Um, and here's some of the, the various logos. So I mentioned GDB. It stands for GNU Debugger. Um, and you might wonder what the difference between debugging and disassembling is. Um, most of the time when we talk about disassembling programs, we also want to debug them. Um, and debugging is, uh, well, interactive debugging at least, um, is examining and modifying the program state uh, while it's running. Um, so this is generally how we get more information about a binary to actually exploit it, uh, because we want to see what it does. We want to see uh, what variables it's holding. Um, and we can't always do that just by looking at the output of a disassembler. Um, here's a, a list of useful commands for GDB. We don't need to stay on this slide for too long. It's mostly for reference if you're looking at um, the slides later for some of the challenges. Um, but some key uh, commands that I want to point out, um, of course, run is, is how you actually start your program executing so you can uh, modify some of its state. Um, setting breakpoints is very key. If you're in CS33, you're probably very familiar with this concept already because of the explode bomb. Um, but that will stop execution when it hits uh, a specified point in the, in the program. Um, print and X are used for uh, printing out some data that's at a location. Uh, you can see some of the specifics about how the commands work here. Um, and uh, finally, um, a very, uh, actually two very useful commands, uh, disassemble um, will actually disassemble like the output that we saw from object dump. Um, and that'll show you that the, um, the uh, uh, assembly instructions that the program's about to execute. Um, and you can tell it to disassemble at a specific point or in a specific function. Um, and finally, jump is very useful. That changes the program counter, which is uh, where the program is currently executing from. So you can actually arbitrarily jump uh, within the program. It might not do the things you expected it to because uh, you know, if you've just moved, uh, not all of the variables are set up. Um, not everything is, is uh, correctly working as it would be under normal execution. Um, but if you just want to move to a specific spot in a binary, uh, jump is pretty useful. Um, and at the bottom of the slides here, I have two more links for uh, uh, more information and uh, uh, better cheat sheets than these if these, pro if these um, uh, commands aren't cutting it. All right, so uh, here I have um, the actual uh, uh, demonstration from GDB. So um, we can skip this part uh, in the live demonstration for now, but this is basically just showing uh, disassembling the main function. Um, and then uh, uh, we break it a specified point. So let's start this. Um, so we want to uh, GDB rot 13 takes a second because uh, I'm running on Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, and then we want to disassemble main. Uh, you can shorten commands as long as they're unambiguous. So disassemble can be shortened to disass. Uh, so disass main. Um, and this, of course, shows us uh, the code for the main function. We've already seen this, though. Uh, so uh, the key thing that we want to uh, look at is um, this line here. Uh, we can see that this is a jump, and it uh, jumps right over all of this stuff that we think might be printing out the flag. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, we want to break right before that. So uh, we're going to break on this line here. Uh, and then we're going to examine the state of the registers at that point. So uh, if we do break and then star because it's uh, here. Oh, actually, um, sorry, I need to uh, run that first. Um, we want to break at the main function. Uh, and then we want to run. Uh, and then we want to, oh, uh, uh, then we want to break at that point. So we need to uh, disassemble main again. Um, oh, it didn't change the, oh, because I'm not running. Right. Uh, let's restart. OK. Um, yeah, OK. So one thing you might notice. Um, that whole thing that I just did, uh, the address of um, main has actually changed. You'll notice all of these um, addresses are different. That's because uh, when it was just sitting on disk, uh, the program had, or sorry, the, the 
uh, lines within the program had you know some offset from the beginning of the uh, the file. But once it's actually loaded into memory, um, that gets some offset in memory, and so those numbers actually change. So uh, we do have to uh, actually modify the, um, our breakpoints uh, and set them you know once it's running uh, so that they're the the correct lines for this run of the program. Um, so we want to break right here. Let's see this line right here. Um, so quit that and then break on this line. OK, cool. Um, so if I hit C for continue, uh, it's going to ask us for some input. I'll put in a couple of A's. Um, and now we're at our breakpoint. So at this point, we can do info registers. Uh, and this tells us what all of our registers are. Of course, uh, we know we are right after a uh, str line call. Um, so of course, if you uh, know the return value for that will be passed in RAX. Um, but it's actually subtracted one and does some other stuff. Um, oh, sorry, this str line call. So yeah, RAX is the result here. And of course, we can see RAX is five, which is the length of the string we put in. Um, and we can see the line that is uh, executed right now, um, or will execute once we restart, is where our breakpoint is set. So that's a jump if below um, 0x20 and RAX. So um, since RAX was the result of our str line call, uh, that's only five, and that will be uh, less than uh, 0x20, which is 32. Um, so we are actually going to jump right over all this uh, sort of flag stuff. Um, one thing we could do is if we're pretty confident in the state of our program right now, uh, I could just jump to this line here, uh, just jump right over that uh, jump instruction um, and just see what happens. Uh, but I am actually going to solve this in a different way. Um, so if I continue, of course, it prints the uh, expected output from ROT13. Um, but I'm going to rerun this. Um, now, if you remember the str line call, it was comparing the result of that with 32. Um, so I'm just going to see what happens if I put in something longer than 32. So I'm going to put in a really long string, um, just a whole bunch of A's. We'll put a couple more for good measure. Um, and now we can see uh, if we do info registers, we can now see that RAX is 0x42, which is, of course, much larger than our uh, compare check. So if we continue now, aha, we can see it does in fact print a flag. So our intuition was correct, um, you know, in terms of what that uh, compare and jump did um, and what all those move ABS stuff uh, was. Um, so the uh, screenshots for all this are on the slides if you want to review that demo at any point. Um, uh, one thing before I hand it over to Jeff, uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, stripped symbols. Um, so if I go ahead and quit here, um, so like I mentioned, the strip command with um, the strip command um, will remove the symbols table. Um, I want to very briefly show you what the output um, of a stripped binary looks like so you can sort of understand uh, the, um, the difficulty in uh, sort of uh, decompiling and debugging a, a stripped binary, which may become, uh, become relevant later. So uh, we're going to use the strip command, um, and we're going to do dash O, rot 13, and we'll call it dash S because the symbols have been stripped. Um, and if we now do uh, object dump uh, dash D, rot 13 S to rot 13 S dot hex, and we'll throw that into Emacs. Uh, to be correct. Um, so you can see it looks mostly the same, at least this first part here. Um, but if I try and search for main, you can see main is nowhere found within the binary. So um, that's going to be a, a difficult problem. Um, the only thing that we really have is uh, we can tell where the dot text section, which is all of the code, starts. And we can see if we compare this with our original, um, this is in fact the same uh, assembly output. Um, if we scroll down far enough, we'll see all these move ABS and all of the move bytes below that. Um, but the problem is uh, we didn't know that this was the main function. Um, and so we're not sure where main starts, uh, in fact, in this binary. Um, and uh, you know, we can't actually be, be sure of uh, the function calls or um, you know, many of those things that, that we were used to uh, with uh, debugging on the first binary. Um, so this is a lot more difficult. Um, you, know, you, can, you still get the same disassembled output, but it's not nicely split up into functions. Um, of course, the computer can still interpret this fine. Um, this is just makes it more difficult for you. Uh, so if you encounter a stripped binary, uh, it is a difficult process. That's why those are the harder challenges. Um, but it's the same 
basic process, the same basic tools. Um, it's just more difficult. Uh, all right, and uh, that's it for me. I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff to talk about uh, decompilers. All right. Um... Can you guys see my screen? Here we go. So, okay, so here we go. So I'm gonna talk about the, okay, I I need to switch my mics one sec. All right, hello? Sorry about that delay. Uh, I was giving myself some echo there. Um, I cannot hear anything. Here we go, hello? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, we're good, we're good. Yeah, so I, I, I was just giving myself an echo. So um, we're gonna talk about decompilers. So you might think, what's a decompiler? Well, if you go back to our compilation stage, you can see that um, decompiler undoes the here undoes the compiler part of it. Wow, what a surprising result! But um, decompilers in the um, what as what they accomplish kind of go one step further than this assembly, and they attempt to recreate the source code instead of just the intermediate representation. So that uh, basically allows you to convert the machine code in directly into a higher level programming language, effectively doing the uh, doing a lot of the work for you. So how does it do that? How does it do this? Well, uh, the decompiler basically just performs analysis on the machine independent intermediate representation. So uh, when it, uh, look, starts at the entry point of the binary, and it does a data, data flow analysis. So basically, it traces the reads and writes, the registers, and infers information from that. Then it also does type analysis. So um, type analysis um, is where, um, by looking at the operations on the registers, they can infer um, basically what type variables are. And so basically, um, through these kinds of analyses and a little bit of magic, um, uh, we are able to structure the intermediate representation into higher level constructs. Oh yeah, one more thing to note is that a lot of uh, decompilers, as you can see here, are also disassemblers. Uh, if I can, yeah. So are also disassemblers, and this is because of what I said before, where uh, we have to convert the intermediate representation into the binary or uh, into the source code. We can't do it directly from the binary, so. Um, basically, uh, these decompilers also have to do disassembly to do their job. All right. So today's topic of conversation or, of the demo is uh, Gidra, uh, which is an open source uh, reverse engineering tool developed by the NSA. I think it was uh, made open source in 2019. Uh, it basically comes with a disassembler and decompiler. You can also patch code, and you can compile modified data. So if you haven't already, go to this link. And I have um, this uh, Google Doc if you uh, end up a little bit behind and you need to catch up. So here's my demo. Wait, everyone can hear me, right? I can't hear myself anymore, so it feels weird now. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Too. Yeah, <laughs> OK. All right. So. Let me get into my virtual box. So um, today's demo is from uh, crackmes.1. It's basically just a website with a lot of crackmes. You don't know what a crackme is. It's basically um, a binary that's designed to be reverse engineered. So uh, we have this easy one here. Let me get it really quick. Go. Hey, we have it downloaded. So um, let me just unzip this. Go. So, oh uh, yeah. Also from this uh, website, CrackMe's, um, all the pa uh, all the binaries are password protected. I mean, all the zip files with the binaries are password protected. So, 
you just use the password there, which is this password is crackmes.1. And so I already did this before, so let me just replace everything. Uh, go to crack me. And let me unzip this rev 50. All right. So now we have this binary called rev 50 Linux 64 that bit. So um, just uh, for demonstration's sake, I'm just going to run it really quick. For fun, ignore this. So let me just put in some random stuff. OK, so you can see that it's telling me that it has a usage error, and it's saying try again. So basically, we need to have some password as the command line argument, and it's basically telling me that I'm bad. So here we go with Ghidra. Ghidra um, is a very nice um, uh, UI-based um, reverse engineering tool. So. When you first open it up, after you download it, uh, you can either open up the UI with Ghidra Run on Linux or Ghidra Run.bat if you're on Windows. And then after that, let's uh, ignore this. Um, so project. All right. So yeah, first you have to open a new project. So you might think that this has to be in the same you might think that this has to be in the same um, folder as the binary, but in reality, it's just uh, the place for you to store the like the decompiled um, data. So uh, it doesn't have to be in the same directory. Uh, right? See, I'm serving it in a like, Ghidra projects directory. So let me just call this uh, demonstration or just demo. All right. So now we have this demo. So there's two ways we can. Uh, Bring in, import our demo. Uh, we can either drag, drag and drop it like this. So it was in here. So I can just drag and drop it like so. And then it'll tell me all the details. It's inferred from the file type. So we can see that it's an L file. And it was compiled using GCC, et cetera, et cetera. But um, we can also do this later in the code view directory. directly. And uh, we'll get to that later. So uh, you can see. It just basically tells you a summary of the import. So um, here we go with the code browser. So um, when you double click on this, uh, when you double click on this binary, it opens up the code browser. So there's that nice little dragon icon. And so this is the code browser. So here it's giving you a prompt to analyze it. So let's do that. Here we can see a bunch of um, the options for you to analyze. Uh, basically, for our purposes, we can leave all of these as the default, but you can read more about them over here with the description. All right. So um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you can import it here. But um, this might look a little confusing at first, but let's just break it down into parts. So first, we have the program trees over here. So basically, this tells you all the basic structure of the program. So um, if you've ever done assembly, this is where they have all the sections. So uh, the, the dot text where your your um, your actual programming uh, code is, uh, the dot data where like variables are, and uh, dot ESS, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here is the symbol tree, and so basically this just um, has a lot of the higher level constructs. So for example, uh, we have uh, functions. So if you can see here, we can see a lot of the library functions that I'm using, as well as main. And then we can also see some other labels. And if uh, we're using, say, like C++, we would have uh, classes that we can use, that we can see, I mean. And then uh, over here is the data type manager. So this is uh, where we could um, sort of classify stuff. Uh, this is a little more advanced. And I think uh, it's something that you should probably experiment with on your own. Um, so um, yeah, let's just um, get into this first. So um, so here are the two main windows of um, Hydra. We have the listing view and the decompile view. So uh, if you can't tell, uh, the decompile view is sort of the, the decompiled version of the assembly on the left. So um, let me go to, say, main. 
So here is our main assembly code, as well as our decompiled version on the right. So as you can see on the right side, uh, Ghidra actually did a pretty good job with um, decompiling our code. Um, I think you would be able to do it directly. Um, you would able, be able to solve this uh, challenge directly with this uh, binary, or this uh, decompiled version. However, um, there's some ways we can make it easier on our lives. So um, first of all, uh, we can, one thing we can do is change our labels. So um, see here, we can see that this is taking the length of a string of something. So let's just call this um, string length. We could do this by renaming this variable from the default um, Ghidra value, which is uh, sfar1. And we can relabel it as, say, string length. So that sort of clarifies our code a little bit more. It makes it a little more human readable. Another thing we can do is, um, since we know that main function uh, uh, with uh, its command line arguments is uh, int main argc argv, uh, we can actually um, clarify that. Because um, Ghidra doesn't have the information to fully infer its types, we can actually tell it directly what its types is. So here, we can edit its function signature. So instead of just an undefined eight, which is, uh, we can change it to an int. And then instead of just param1, some random name that it gives it, we can give it the name argc. And then instead of um, param2, it could be argv. And then we can directly type this pointer. So uh, you might be thinking, oh, it's a car pointer to, it's a uh, pointer to an array of uh, strings. Or it's an array of pointers, I mean. Uh, well, um, Gita doesn't quite like this. Um, it's because um, it directly translates the brackets into the name. So it doesn't really understand this. And I think it's just, yeah. So um, we can change, we can do this instead where we use uh, the double pointer terminology, where it's a pointer to a pointer. It's functionally the same. And as you can see now, when I've done this, it auto, Gidra automatically does the array um, sort of um, conversion, a lot of the pointer math conversion for us, so we don't really have to think about it that much. So you can see that our code is a lot better now. So we can actually start kind of understanding this. So for example, here, we're checking if uh, we have two command line arguments. Um, if you can't remember, um, with, uh, C arg um, with the C uh, command line uh, main function, uh, the, the um, program itself, the program name itself, is also an argument. So it's just asking for one more argument besides that. And you, see, you can see that we're taking this argument over here. So um, we can also, um, in, in Ghidra, we can also note down these kinds of observations with our comments. So for example, let me just put a pre-comment. So hmm, let me just say, uh, takes in one extra argument. So you can see that. It's a comment here, and it also shows up in our assembly on the left. So, oh yeah, uh, I forgot to mention. Um, if you highlight code on the right decompile ver mode, eh, decompile window, it also um, highlights the assembly code on the left, so you can directly compare the two. And this is really useful when you're trying to understand some Ghidra decompiled code that doesn't really make sense, because Ghidra sometimes does things that where um, it's technically correct, but it's not quite correct. So um, there's that direct comparison. Remember that it, because the assemblers can't perfectly recreate the, the original, how can decompilers? So um, yeah, let me go back. All right. So <clears throat> you can see that we're calling printf here. And we're checking over here if um, the fifth character of the the string that we're inputting, our, our extra argument is in that sign. Oh yeah, we also should note that this is length of extra argument is 10. So let me just put that. Let me note the other observation I've made that fifth character is an at. There we go. So with these comments, we can kind of clean up our code and this just makes it easier for everyone. So um, let me just demonstrate that we've reached the right answer. So 
Uh, you can see that we need 10 characters and the fifth one needs to be not. So it's pretty simple. We just run the binary here and then we just give it one, two, three, four, and fifth characters and at, and then one, 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 all the way to 10 characters. So that's five extra ones. And there we go. We've got our flag. So um, a few things. A few more things to note is that um, a lot of things in Ghidra, you can kind of access the li uh, the listing of by double clicking. So for example, um, over here, we're calling string length. We can do go directly to its code right here by double click clicking it. So um, you can see here, you've double clicked to it and we have this punk. Um, you can press alt left to go back to uh, your calling function. Uh, another thing to note is that there's, you might have noticed these uh, xrefs near the beginning of the function. Like uh, these are sort of um, locations in memory that like you just take note of. So we can, if I, okay, I'll just, okay, if I uh, hover over them, you can see um, there's a cursor. Wait, here we go. Uh, here's a cursor where um, we're actually uh, writing to that uh, address in memory. So um, we can actually uh, look at it here, and we can also double click on it to go directly to it. So uh, these are sort of the uh, references that we can check and see um, like um, uh, how memory is affected. And uh, finally, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you can double click on these sections and you can also go to the locations of these sections. So those are some pretty important um, features. All right. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to do this for bomb lab, you can, but like it's like overkill, really overkill. You don't need to. <laughs> so all right, uh, that's basically the end of my demonstration. And if you need any questions, answers, concerns. Mm. <laughs> All right, so that is it for the main section of the workshop. And there should be challenges up on the ACM website for you guys to work on. Um, thank you, uh, Jeffrey, Luke, and Matt for the presentation. Yeah, and we'll stay in the main room as usual. If you have any questions, let us know.